Okay, folks, we're back again. I just uh, had gone through about two-thirds of this, uh, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, everything just sort of shut off. So um, I'm going to try this again while I'm still awake and I'm still somewhat coherent, although I definitely need coffee at this point. But let's let's just talk about the, the uh, what we talked about in the WebEx in regards to the, to the head, uh, face, and trunk and go over some of those muscles. So let's, let's hit that. And that's me at the James Bond. Okay, that's a little joke, but anyway, let's just talk about this in this frontal plane view and try to get it down really quick. Well, I'll try to re-establish re what we talked about in the in the um, in the lab, okay, or in the uh, WebEx meeting. First muscle I want to talk about is the muscle that's up in here, and this muscle up in here and here, okay, is called the frontalis, and it's sometimes called the epicranius or the occipital frontalis muscle because what happens is there's a part of the muscle belly in the front, and there's a part of the muscle belly in the back, and they're connected by a band of dense connective tissue, which is called an aponeurosis, the epicranial aponeurosis that connects the frontalis in the front with the occipitalis in the back, and so. Based Basically, they, they, they link them together or they lump them together as the epicranius or occipital frontalis muscle or something like that, even though this portion right here would be the frontalis frontal portion, okay? And, and up in here and up in here, that's all the frontalis, okay? Um, uh, and when you wrinkle your eyebrows and you, or you raise your eyebrows and you wrinkle forehead, that's the muscle that does it. It's the frontalis muscle that does it. One thing I should mention about muscles, I mentioned this in the WebEx, I mentioned it on the one that just crashed, okay, uh, is that what happens is the muscles of the, of, the, of, of the face and the head, and a lot of the muscles of the head, not all of them, but a lot of the muscles of the face or the muscles of facial expression uh, attach to bone. Instead of attaching to another bone, they attach to skin. So what happens is instead of having a typical uh, bone that attaches bone or muscle that attaches bone to bone. They actually have a muscle that now attaches bone at one side and skin. Okay, which makes it when you're when, I know when they're dissecting uh, uh, the head is a, is a real bear because what happens is you're trying to preserve the muscles and you're cutting off the skin and it's just hard because of the the muscles embedded in the skin and it's all kinds of crazy things. But anyway, when my forehead wrinkles, it's because the muscle is stabilized here because it goes to the, that epineurosis and attached in the back at the occipitalis. If you look in the back, remember that external occipital protuberance back there. Uh, there's a line that goes to the left side and line that goes to the right side. Which which is my superior nuchal line, which we talked about in the skull. And basically that's where the occipitalis, the bottom portion, the inferior portion of the occipitalis is there, attaches there, covers the occipital region and continues with that aponeurosis, that dense connective tissue over the top until it meets the frontalis in the front. So anyway, that's the frontalis muscle there, okay? So that's the frontalis. Next muscle I just want to briefly talk about is down here. This is the temporalis. And the temporalis, you see just a little bit of it. You know, if I'm looking, I'm looking at the side and I'm looking, I'm looking basically coming in. Where is my little curve? There it is right there. Oops, it's coming in right here. This is the, this is the temporalis right here. We talked about this in the lab where if we look at the temporal fossa on the skull, it's a little bit concave to flat to concave. It's an area where the skull gets a little thinner around the teria and stuff like that. Area right, it's particularly vulnerable on the inside of the skull because there's a middle meningeal artery as well as the middle cerebral artery that runs really close to underneath there. So the, the temporalis provides a little bit of protection, you know, that area where it's a little bit weaker, a little bit more vulnerable on the side of the head. But what it really is mostly important for is it's a muscle of chewing. It's what's called a muscle of mastication. Uh, mastication means to chew. And what happens is large muscle is sort of like a fan-shaped muscle that fills that temporal fossa and then it sort of like narrows down and runs under Underneath the zygomatic arch and attaches that coronoid process on the mandible. And when it fires, it pulls my jaw tight. If you take your hands and stick it over your temporal region and you bite down, you can feel how that muscle tightens up. And that's the temporalis muscle. It's, it's a muscle of mastication or a muscle of chewing. Okay, and we'll see it a little bit better when you go to that lateral view. Okay, next muscle I want to show here is up here. The orbicularis oculi muscle, the orbicularis oculi. Now, orbicularis sounds like orbit, which is exactly what it is, and that's this big muscle that orbits around the eye. Oculi obviously means eye, orbicularis means an orbit, okay? And that's what this muscle is. Um, this muscle is really important because it closes my eye. So when I want to close my eyes and hold my eyes shut, these muscles, will, this muscle will will fire. Now, if I'm looking at this muscle, actually, I have a couple different uh, bands of that muscle. The one band on the outside, which is out in here, this area right here, is called the orbital portion. 
called the orbital portion. It's a big orbit around the outside. The part that's on the inside, closer to the eyelid in here, is called the palpable portion. Palpable means eye, eye or eyelid, okay? So the palpable portion is the part that is around the eyelid that will help to close the eyes. Not open the eyes, but help to close the eyes. And that's our orbicularis oculi, the orbital part and the palpable part, okay? Uh, I should mention, I just show it really quick. And I didn't mention this on the WebEx, but if I look here on this orbicularis oculi, right about here, there's a little band. You can see a little band right there. There's a little ligament that actually holds it so that it stabilizes that whole orbital uh, or a ring of, of muscle around the eye. It's attached here. There's also a little area where it attaches laterally, you know, on the lateral portion of that orbit around the, around the, the orbital a rim around the eye. So that's called the orbicularis oculi, orbicularis oculi, okay? Next muscle I wanna show is the masseter, okay? Now that masseter is this muscle down in here. You only see a little bit of it here because you're at, a, at an angle. The masseter is also a muscle of mastication or a chewing muscle. It's that very strong muscle in the jaw that when you clench down your teeth, you can feel how, the, how your jaw sort of tightens up on the side, okay? Okay. Uh, I know uh, if, you're, see the, if you're a fan of the Rocky movies, you know, now they've gone with the Creed movies. And if you look at, what's his name, Michael B. Jordan, then you watch him, he'll sit there and, you know, it's, it gets really dramatic. He starts to grind his mouth. And you can see these masters just pump out like, 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 you know, bulge, you know, like somebody's biceps do. Just huge masters. Anyway, the masters are really a very strong muscle because it's, once it, it's for closing the mouth, okay? It's exceptionally strong when it, when the mouth closes, when the masseter fires, it's probably the strongest mount, uh, muscle pound for pound in the body. You can't get the mouth open. If you have somebody say, oh, close your mouth and don't let me open it, you're not gonna open it unless you take a sledgehammer and have, and have their jaw and then you'll be in jail because of that, so don't do that. But that's called the masseter. So it's a muscle of mastication or a chewing muscle. I'll show a little bit more of this when we get to our lateral view, like we did in lab. They'll show you exactly where uh, a couple other things about the master that I think are really important. Let's go down another one here, and we talk about the buccinator. Okay, now if I'm talking about the buccinator, you actually see a little bit like here, right in front of the master, but actually it's underneath the master, it's deep to the master. Okay, and what the buccinator does is controls the cheeks. Bucco, buccal means cheek, and so basically the buccinator is a muscle that's in the walls of the cheeks. Okay, that actually help to keep the cheeks nice and tight. So as a result, we don't get a lot of food trap between the, the gums and the, and the cheek, on the inside of the cheek, okay? That buccal mucosa. Keeps it nice and tight. Also, people who play like wind instruments, trumpet, clarinet, trombone, blah, blah, tuba, whatever. Uh, when, they, when they're blowing out through the instrument, they use the buccinator to actually force the air out a little bit. So anyway, that's the buccinator. I'll show you a little bit more about the importance of the buccinator again when we get to the lateral view. I'll show you another particular exciting thing about the buccinator that, that I, I think is sort of cool to know. Okay. Next, next muscle I want to go to is this one down here. This is called the orbicularis oris. Okay. We have an orbicularis oculi that goes around the, around the eye. Here's the orbicularis oris that goes around the mouth in an orbit the same way. It goes around the mouth. And what the orbicularis orbit, or oris does, as you could probably imagine, closes the mouth nice and tight. Okay? So that orbicularis oris closes the mouth and real tight. The lips, not the teeth, but the lips. It's really not a muscle of mastication because it's not involved in chewing. It's just a muscle that will actually close to keep the mouth closed. And that's called the orbicularis oris. Now, one of the things I should mention all about, also about the orbicularis oris is it's also similar to the orbicularis oculi that right at the, this is called the angle of the lip right here. Angle, angle right here. It's an angle angle. What happens, there's also a little area of a ligamentous structure right here, or a little dense connective tissue that help to stabilize the, the vicularis oris at the, at the angles of the, of the mouth, okay? So that's also what we see in that vicularis oris, okay? Let's get rid of those lines out of there. Okay, and let's go to the next muscle. Next muscle I want to talk about is the depressor labi inferioris. Now, if you look at a lot of the uh, facial muscles, a lot of them tell you, and, and in fact, a lot of the muscles in the rest of the body, uh, will tell you exactly what they are, okay? So whoever named them was actually thinking and saying, hey, let's name this what it, what it does, where it's at, and stuff like that. Depressor means to depress, bring things down. So if I see a word that says depressor, I know it's lowering something. So therefore, it, we know that the suppressor a labi inferioris is lowering something. Labi means lip. Inferioris means inferior. So basically, what we're talking about the depressor labi inferioris is is this area in here, these two muscles right here, they're actually bringing the lip downward, okay? 
bring the lip downward, you know, and that's the depressor alebi inferioris. It brings the lip down, okay? So that makes sense. Just look at the name. The name pretty much tells you what's going on with that. Next muscle I want to talk about is this one right here called the mentalis. The mentalis is basically this area right here. This muscle right here comes and attaches the lip right here, a very small muscle, a couple little tabs that come up in there. That's the mentalis. The reason why it's called the mentalis is because it's in the mental region. We talked about the tip of the chin being called the mental region. What do you think it does? It pulls the lip down this way as well, along with the depressor alebi inferioris. Helps to pull the lip down. Okay, and that's called the mentalis. Okay. Next muscle I want to show here is depressor anguli oris. Depressor anguli oris. Now depressor means again lower. Okay. Uh, anguli means the angle. So basically, if this is the angle right here, it's taking the angle and pulling it down, and this muscle right here is a dep depressor anguli oris. What's going to do? It's going to bring the bring the bring this corner of the mouth down. Okay, and that's what it does. Thank you very much. Okay, so that brings that that that, uh, that that corner of the mouth down that way. Depressor anguli oris. Depressor lowers anguli angle oris mouth. Okay, makes sense. Everything sort of falls in place here, and and makes makes a lot of sense. Next muscle I want to show is this little muscle right here. I, I, I you know I probably spent too much time on on the last one that, that went kaplui, but that's this little muscle right here. It's called the rhizorius. Rhizorius is actually, sometimes you can't even find it. It's so thin and so wispy, it blends with the skin so much, it's sometimes very difficult to be able to identify it. I know in labs, when we were doing it in the lab and the instructor would come around, or when I was a lab TA and enemy TA, kids would try to tell me, that's the rhizorius that come and take some muscle fibers, you know, of all the other muscles there and sort of like stretch them a little bit and put the rhiz put it there and say, that's the rhizorius. And I say, yeah, it might be, I don't know. Sometimes you don't even see see it okay but that's called the rhizorius and you could just think by its location if you look where it's at because it's at the angle it attaches the angle as but it's, even though it's wispy pulls the angle of the jaw back in this direction or not the jaw the angle of the lip back in that direction and that's called the rhizorius okay a small yeah you know, it's, it's okay it's you know everybody has a purpose somewhere I guess so anyway that's the rhizorius next muscles I've, I've lumped them together the zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor and basically that's this muscle and this muscle right here now if you look at those they're a little bit different from the rhizorius because they are a little bit more bulky okay and frequently they're together sometimes there's not much of a gap or part of it will be together and they'll split a little bit more up in this area okay but they do come to this area of the lip so the upper outer portion of the lip so it brings the lip up and back where the rhizorius brought the brought the lip back this way the angle lip this brings it up yeah 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 it brings it up that way so that's the that's the that's the uh, zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor guess what what bone they attach to obviously the zygomatic arch or the zygoma so they attach the area of the zygoma right here come down in this this area just this direction here and it brings the, the lip up in this direction so the lip when this when when, it, when the zygomaticus major and minor fire the lip goes up in that direction okay so that's the zygomaticus major the zygomaticus minor okay let's get rid of that Next muscle, levator labi superioris. Okay, levator labi superioris. And basically, that's this muscle right here. If we look down in here, this is the levator labi superioris. It's going to be sitting right there. And, and it makes sense. Where depressor means to lower, levator means to elevate. Elevate, levator brings it up. What does it do? Levator labi, labi I mentioned means lip superioris, it's on the top. So it's the opposite of the depressor labi superioris because it's actually pulling the lip up, bringing the lip up, okay? So that's the uh, levator labi superioris, coming, bringing, bringing the lip up in this direction, up towards the eye, okay? Levator labi superioris. Right, whoops, let me get rid of that. Right next to it, Okay, really close is a lever labi superioris muscle. It's a little bit different. Okay, and what happens is this muscle right here, okay, uh, is sort of has a different name. Okay, and they always say lever labi muscle uh, superioris, but actually it has a longer name. And I don't know why they didn't put it on here. Maybe they just were didn't didn't were too tired or too weak to put it on. It's actually called the lever labi superioris eloquai nasi. It's a very small muscle, doesn't do a whole lot, but has a huge monster name. It's little things, you know, little little guy with a big name, okay? Levator labi superioris eloquinaceae. So levator labi, I know it lifts up this corner of the lip, um, but labi superioris eloquai. Eloquai 
uh, means that this portion of the nose, when I look at the nostril, okay, the nostril area right here, that's called the alar region of the nose. So basically, when I flare my nostrils or open my nostrils up and pull my I snort, what happens is that lever laid by superior equine nasi is pulling up the nostrils, opening up the nostril, I didn't put my finger in my nose, pulling up the nostril that way and, and lifting it up, okay? I, I had a lab, uh, my, my first, uh, or I think it was my, my one anatomy uh, instructor uh, in the med medical program basically uh, used to test people. What's the what's what's the smallest muscle with the longest name? It's really not the smallest muscle, but small compared to its name, and that was a lever laid by superior so eloquent nasal. Eventually, we get out extra credit and stuff like that until everybody got it right. But that's that because everybody just like walking around saying lever laid by superior is eloquent nasal. You know? So I mean, I, and I'm I'm probably over that, you know. Although um, lever laid by superior is I don't know. Never mind. Okay, I'm sort of like in a trance right now. It's uh, going on too, so I gotta get moving here. So anyway, that's that. Okay, uh, over here we have a levator anguli oris, and basically what that is is that that's this muscle on the other side. Okay, and basically what it does is it elevates the angle. Again, the angle of the lip is this area. It elevates and pulls that angle up this way. Okay, so that's called the levator anguli oris muscle elevates the angle of the mouth pretty much it tells you exactly what it does okay so that's pretty cool okay, I'll, I'll tell you a lot one last muscle here i want to mention is called the platysma the platysma is this large muscle on both sides this area here this this area in here and that's the platysma it's a very thin muscle very almost like a strap muscle it covers over those big cord like muscles the sternocleidomastoid very thin muscle it comes from the area of the clavicle it fills in this area above the clavicle and comes up and runs underneath the chin and over to the angle and uh, over the uh, lower border of the of the mandible and that's what it is so it, it's a, it doesn't it doesn't ha it doesn't it holds things together more than anything else it doesn't there's not a whole lot that it really functionally does but it holds things together and that's called the platysma okay that's always a good one to ask on a lab practical now I, I, I'm I'm going to expect you to understand which nerves supply which muscles, okay? And you're going to say, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of muscles. We have. How am I going to learn this? It's so simple, okay? There are two main groups of muscles in the face. One group of muscles called the muscles of mastication. We already talked about two. We talked about the masseter, you know. Talked about the the masseter here. We talked about the temporalis here, okay? And those are muscles of mastication. Okay, let me get rid of the platysma so that doesn't confuse you. Those are muscles of mastication. There are two more. There are two more, that, and they're called the medial and lateral pterygoids. The medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid. And it makes, makes probably a lot of sense. They both come from that pterygoid plate from the sphenoid, like we all know, that pterygoid plate with those two plates that came down directly inferiorly from the sphenoid. And what happens is they attach, and what the, what the, where the masseter and the temporalis clench the jaw and hold the jaw closed, what the pterygoids do is they move the jaw side to side and front to back. And that's what the pterygoids do. All these muscles of mastication, four of them on each side, temporalis, masseter, medial and lateral pterygoids, are supplied by a, 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 one nerve with branches, and that's going to be the fifth cranial nerve. That fifth cranial nerve, you can see there's my all five fingers, fifth cranial nerve, it's called the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve supplies them. Uh, interestingly enough, the trigeminal nerve also supplies them the sensation of the face, the sinuses, some of the taste and stuff like that. So this, the trigeminal nerve has a big job to do, okay? That's called the muscles of mastication. All the other muscles, with the exception of one, all the other muscles, with the exception of one, are basically called muscles of facial expression. Okay, so let me get rid of my mastication muscles over here. All these other muscles are called muscles of facial expression. And basically, it's really, if it's not cranial nerve five, then most likely it's gonna be cranial nerve seven. Cranial nerve seven is called the facial nerve. Facial, facial expression, facial nerve, how simple can that be? Okay, it's exceptionally simple. So muscles of mastication, cranial nerve five, muscles of facial expression, cranial nerve seven, facial nerve. I said there's one exception. And that one exception that I want to mention really quick is called the levator palpebrae superioris. Now, I didn't show this on here. What happens to levator palpebrae superioris is a very small, very thin muscle that attaches to the rim of the orbit, okay, on the, on the muscle, on the bone, and comes down and, and, and is inside the eyelid. If you feel your eyelid, your eyelid's not really very, very thick. But part of it that's in there is basically that levator palpebrae superioris. And what the levator palpebrae superioris does, no, no 
no uh, no uh, surprise here is it elevates the eyelid it elevates the eyelid up it's supplied by a different nerve and that's supplied by cranial nerve 3 or the or the oculomotor nerve okay the oculomotor nerve now the oculomotor why is it supplied by 3 well first of all because the origin of that muscle is in the orbit itself so therefore the, we remember when we looked at the skull there were those creases those cracks the fissures in the back of the orbit the superior orbital fissure that cranial nerve 3 the oculomotor nerve came through that as well as cranial nerve 4 and cranial nerve 6 they came through that little fissure okay so therefore it's easy to get to that muscle that's a, that, that's inner that, that's attached on the inner portion of the rim or of the of the orbit just above the eye to bring the eyelid up by the oculomotor nerve the oculomotor nerve also supplies four of the six muscles that cause the eye movements okay and it also innervates the muscle that controls the size of the pupil when the oculomotor nerve fires the pupil gets small okay so I'm in a dark in, in a bright room you see the pupils get smaller why it's that third cranial nerve the oculomotor nerve that says let's fire the muscles of that iris which is the colored area around the pupil because the pupil is basically only a hole that's why it's black it's a hole and it's dark inside it causes that the, the muscles of the iris to constrict and narrows that pupil okay and that's what the oculomotor nerve does when that ocular nerve stops working okay what happens is then the pupil will dilate so if we go into a dark room then all of a sudden the pupil gets bigger and it gets bigger I can't see there you go it gets bigger instead of smaller it gets bigger why because that oculomotor nerve says relax lets the pupil get big that's why when people are essentially brain dead what they do is they look for pupils that are fixed and dilated and the reason why they're fixed and dilated they don't respond to light they won't change because the ocular motor nerve is no longer working the brain stops working ocular motor nerve stops working as if you if you've looked ahead and, and looked at the at the cranial nerves you can understand that so now that ocular motor nerve doesn't work and as a result because of that um, you know we're up a creek okay and the eyes that will, will, will dilate the pupils will dilate okay so that's what we have on this side now if I go to this slide over here this lateral slide right here I it, it, it I could see a couple things number one looking laterally a couple things I see first of all I could actually see that area of the uh, the temporalis so you can see where the temporalis muscle is that fills that temporal fossa and my computer's doing the same thing it did on this slide the last time. Darn, oh, there it goes. Good. It fills that temporal fossa. So let's look at that temporalis, where that temporalis muscle is. Oh, here's the occipital frontalis, first of all. Back in here, this area back in here is the occipitalis right here. And again, this is that superior nuchal line right here. External occipital protuberance would be right there, superior nuchal line. And above that is where that occipitalis attaches. And then what happens, it connects to the frontalis which is right here by the epicranial aponeurosis or that band of fascial tissue. Sorry. So that's the occipital, occipitalis, part of the occipital frontalis, the epicranius, the occipitalis muscle, whichever way you want to look at it. So that's what that is. And we mentioned it doesn't do a whole lot, just stabilize. Actually, what it does is it stabilize the frontalis so the frontalis could, could contract and wrinkle the forehead. That's about what, it, what its major function would be. Okay. So that's the occipitalis portion of the occipital frontalis or epicranius muscle. The next one is the temporalis again the, here's the temporalis muscle that we see right here here's a temporalis whoop get in there here we see the temporalis right here and it, as it, it sort of narrows down it thins out and it's got a big fan up in here okay comes down and attaches that coronoid process of the of the mandible sitting right here and that and again it's running underneath that zygomatic arch and here's the zygomatic arch that you see right there so it runs underneath that and that's where it goes so it attaches the mandible it helps to close the jaw and that's the temporalis muscle okay um, sternocleidomastoid let me get rid of these these lines up in here this is the stern sternocleidomastoid that's that big neck muscle you see down in here it runs at an angle come on there we go this muscle right here is called the sternocleidomastoid, okay? And the thing that's about that sternocleidomastoid, uh, it runs from the sternum, so it's at the end, it runs, attaches to the end of the sternum. Clido, clido is actually another word that means clavicle, okay? And mastoid, and mastoid we know is that little bump on the back of the temporal bone back in here. It runs in this. If I take my jaw, my hand, and put it like this, I don't know if you can see it, because I'm looking at the other, and you can actually see the sternocleidomastoid coming at an angle like that. So it's involving in stabilizing the head and rotation of the neck, and that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle, okay? And you, get all, you could play with your own at, at, in your own leisure if you want, you know, it's up to you, okay? Uh, the trapezius is another muscle. I'll show it more when we get to the back. We see a little bit of the trapezius back in this area, right in here. The trapezius would be this area. Whoops, come on. Here we 
go. Trapezius is this area back in here, okay? And we'll see that a little bit more in the back, but we could actually see it at this, see it, see it here. So we'll show it a little bit more when we show the, the, the back of the trunk in a couple minutes here, hopefully a couple minutes, okay? And the last thing I want to mention here is here's the masseter, okay? If I look at the masseter, here's the masseter here. Here's the masseter here and down here. So that's it. The buccinator would be the buccinator would be this area in deep to the masseter down in here, and it continues all the way back underneath the masseter. But if we look right here in this area right here, what we see is we see this big bubbly area right here, okay? And that is the parotid gland. The parotid gland is a is a salivary gland. It's in front of the angle of my jaw, and it makes saliva as well as makes an enzyme called amylase. And it puts this saliva and the amylase into the mouth to help to moisturize the thing we eat to make a bolus of food, as well as provide some amylase, which starts to help to digest starches. Okay. The reason why I put this here and I want to bring this up, if I'm looking at that, if we look really close, we don't have to look really close. Okay. You see this little thing right here? Whoops. It's not gonna do it. Okay, I'll do it with yellow. Ah, oh, come on, do it. There we go. Yellow right here. That's the product duct. And the product duct, it takes the, 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 the saliva and the amylase from the product gland and comes directly over the top of the masseter. And once it gets to the front end of the masseter, this area out here, actually it goes underneath. It goes and it, 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 it goes deep pierces around the end of the masseter and goes right through and pierces through the buccinator. If you go home and you lift off your cheek and look inside opposite your second upper molar, what you'll see is you might see a little bump up there. And that little bump up there is the area where the duct of that of the product gland empties into your mouth. I had someone uh, today say, ah, oh, hey, I saw that, you know. Uh, I, well, that, well, that's what it was. And basically, that's where that duct of the product gland empties. If people have uh, mumps, mumps is an inf inflammation of the product gland, okay, is when the product gland becomes infected, okay, usually by mostly by a virus that will cause the infection of the product gland. And then sometimes what this duct will actually drain pus into the mouth. Um, the mouse, mouth, 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 mouth. The mouth also makes saliva a number of glands underneath the tongue. If you lift up your tongue, there's a band of tissue that holds the tongue down to the floor of the mouth, and that band is called the frenulum, the frenulum. And on both sides of the frenulum, there'll be little bumps with little holes, and those are also, they're called the sublingual glands, sublingual glands, and they also make saliva. And they're actually going to, if you, sometimes if you lift your tongue up, you'll see them actually shoot. You know, the saliva is under high pressure comes out. And then also at the corner, just underneath the edge of the mandible, um, more towards the side of the floor of the mouth, you'll see some other little ducts. And those are from the submandibular glands that come out through the side. But anyway, this is just, these are just some of the, some of the other things that we wanted to show, you know, in, in looking at the at side of the face. This is just, again, looking at um, a cadaver. We showed this again on the WebEx and how you could actually take and, and, and see some of those muscles. And again, they're not nearly as well defined. Here's my vicular Abicularis oculi, abicularis oris, come around here. Here's the zygomaticus major and minor, come there, see how it splits a little bit. Uh, you can see the platysma down in here, platysma down in here. You know, you can see the uh, 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 levator labi superioris coming right in here. Uh, but a lot of it, all, all these muscles are really difficult to see. I'll let you take your own time when you get a chance and you're sitting there wanna, having nothing else to do. You can actually look at the cadaver and try to compare and find the muscles from the face on the right with the cadaver on the left, okay? And then I've got it laterally. Laterally is the same thing. I could see my abicularis oris right here. Here's the abicularis oculi right here. Uh, this is this area right here would be the masseter. Okay. This is the parotid gland right here. The parotid gland is sitting right here. Uh, you can see the duct. There's the duct right there. Let me erase everything here. And the duct is like, see this little line right there? If you look right where that little line is, I'll put the yellow on the on the duct. Here's the duct right there. And it goes around the edge of the masseter. And this muscle down in here, below it, let me do it a different color. This muscle down in here, let me do blue. Maybe it'll be easier, see? You know, obviously that's the buccinator. Uh, you, can, you can't see much of the temporalis, but you can see actually part of the temporalis here because this is a zygomatic arch. Uh, and you can see a couple of the nasal muscles and stuff like that. But you could take and look at that in your own spare time. I want to mention a few things now uh, about the uh, the trunk, okay? And we'll go through some of these trunk muscles that I think are really important for you to know. This is just a diagram of the anterior portion of the trunk. Let's let's go muscle by muscle. Let's first talk about this one, the sternocleidomastoid. And again, we just we showed that a little bit before on the other 
on the, the head and that's this area right here and you can't see it right here it's been taken off so it's let me do it a different color because it sort of like blends too much this muscle right here would be the sternocleidomastoid okay that's the sternocleidomastoid again we talked about how that actually turns the turns the head and stuff like that so that's the sternocleidomastoid you can see it on yourself it just pops out like a like a sore thumb okay uh, this muscle we can see back in here you only see a little bit of it okay back in here if I'm looking back let me do this way if I'm looking back here I see a little wing sticking up right here above the clavicle and that's called the trapezius hold on to that for just a minute I'll show it a little bit better when we get to the back okay it's called the trapezius very large muscle big triangular shaped muscle it covers most of the back and that's called the trapezius okay next place I want to look at is the deltoid okay now that that deltoid is called deltoid because what happens is when if I, when, if I look at it okay the shape of it is a triangle if I look at it here, it's a triangle here, comes down to the area, that deltoid tuberosity, it comes up. And the front right here is attached to the clavicle right here. It goes over the area of the chromium. The chromium would be right up in the top of the clavicle. And then it follows all the way back towards the spine of the scapula. And that's where the superior borders, clavicle, chromium, spine of the scapula. It's called the deltoid. It's a very strong abductor muscle of the arm, um, very, very powerful in ab abducting the arm, okay? Uh, and that's called the deltoid. Um, and so I, I mentioned a few more things in the WebEx me meeting, but I won't go over those right now because it's probably not all that critical. So that's a big muscle. You can actually see these very well. People who are, who are muscular can actually see the deltoids. Oh, I got great delts, okay? And basically those are the deltoids, okay? So that's a deltoid muscle on there. Next muscle I just want to show you is the pectoralis major. Now that pectoralis major is that huge pectoral muscle. This area right here, okay, this whole area right here is the pectoralis major. Attaches the front of the humerus right there, but it comes all the way here, attaches below the clavicle here, all the way almost to the sternum, fills that whole area. You see all these bodybuilders are sitting there with the with the oil and so bam 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 they're bouncing up and down and basically those are the pectoral muscles just contracting and moving uh, they are helpful in bringing the arms across the body in the front helpful bring the body the, the arms this way uh, if you remember joe thomas <coughs> who was a, a offensive uh, tackle left tackle for the for the browns ha had it had his torn and what happened his arm was like this and his arm was eventually pulled back and you see this a lot of times in linemen and the arm gets pulled back and what happens it rips the deltoid or the excuse me it rips the pectoralis major and those usually require surgery and at that point as Curry says I don't think I'm going to come back and he didn't come back unfortunately but <clears throat> that's a pectoralis major a large pectoral muscle that covers that big portion of the chest okay and it brings the arm forward more than anything else which makes sense if you look at the way a muscle is and where it runs you could probably pretty much evaluate or, or guess at what it does if I look over here on the opposite side though I see what's called a pectoralis minor now the pectoralis minor are these little bands there's a band there band there band there and a band there and they come to the second third fourth and fifth ribs right there and what they do is they are underneath the pectoralis major and they also help a little bit in stabilizing that but they, one thing I, I do want to mention to you is they all attach they attach the pectoralis minor attaches that little bump and you should have automatically pumped up and yourself and said I know what that little bump is I know what that little bump is I know what that little bump is that's the coracoid process remember the coracoid process that little finger that stuck out from the scapula three muscles attach to the coracoid process pectoralis minor short head of the biceps and the coracal brachialis those three muscles attach right there so that's right there that's the pectoralis minor so you should be able to identify the pectoralis minor on a on uh, on a lab practical that's it right there now we see it with all those lines gone next muscle i want to mention is the latissimus dorsi now i'm not going to spend much time on it because you can't see a whole lot of it right now because basically it's sitting right here and it's a large wing muscle it's a huge muscle starts in the back covers a lot of the of the, of the flank area and the back and actually comes up and wraps around to the front portion of the shoulder up in this area in the, in the humerus up in this area it attaches to a whole cuff that's around the area of the head of the humerus and basically that's the latissimus dorsi hold on to that one as well because it's going to come later and you can actually see a little latissimus dorsi on that side okay but i'll show you a better view of that latissimus dorsi uh, when we look at the back okay so let's let's hold off on the latissimus dorsi for now next one is serratus anterior and the serratus anterior you can actually see a little bit on both sides you see it on this side over here at right here 
with these edges that come like serrated, like sharp, like knife edges. And you see a little bit of the serratus anterior over here. The reason why it's called serratus anterior, it's a muscle that wraps around the side of the chest, around the ribs, okay, and attaches to the ribs. But the edges of it are the way that they're that they attach. It attaches in like little wedges, and it looks like the edges of a serrated knife. So if you look at a muscle that's very serrated, up, oh, that's the serratus anterior. So that's the serratus anterior. Um, uh, it, you see it a little bit here, but if I showed a picture from the side, you'd see a lot more of the serratus anterior. But if you see a muscle that comes to the side like this with these serrated edges like that, that's the serratus anterior. Okay. So I think I'd remember that one. Next muscle I want to talk about here. Okay. Are the internal and external um, intercostals. Um, intercostal means between the ribs. And between the ribs, I have uh, th three 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 muscles okay the one on the outside is the external intercostal there's one below that which is the internal intercostal okay uh, and there's one that's sort of there or not there that's deep to that right on the plural okay we won't even talk about it because whether it's how much of it's there is is is, is debatable but the, the intercostals are really important particularly the external intercostal when the external intercostal fires because they attach from one rib to the other rib it actually takes the lower rib and pulls the lower rib up towards the upper rib and what it does is it expands the chest side to side and front to back and what that does that increases the cat the capacity or the volume inside the thoracic cavity which creates like a negative pressure as the diaphragm goes down which then if the mouth is open air rushes into the mouth and then fills up the lungs we'll talk more about the functions of the intercostal muscles when we talk more about the pulmonary section but the intercostals are the muscles that run between the ribs okay and they actually run in different directions the external intercostals run one way down this way and the internal costals run the opposite way you can see the inter internal intercostals right here the external costals are going to be running so my internal intercostals you know are sort of running in in this direction where my external intercostals will run sort of like in a direction like like actually like 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 it's like like this hard to write don't use don't don't try to write with your mouse it doesn't work so the external intercostals on the outside, internal intercostals on the inside. Just remember that, okay? And they're between the intercostal. Costal means we know it means rib, so they're between the ribs. The other one I want to talk about are the abdominal muscles really quick. What happens is the outside, the, the abdominal muscles are relatively thin, but they're in three layers. And by having three layers, it provides considerable strength, okay, and protection. The outer layer is called the external oblique. External because it's on the outside, oblique because the fibers run obliquely. The fibers on the external oblique, okay, run from this way and down. Whoops, let me get that with a different color here. The external oblique fibers run this way. They run down. And I used to tell my PA students the way they used to run. If you take your hands and stick them in your front pocket, your, your hands, your fingers are this way, and that's the direction of the external oblique. Deep to that is the internal oblique. Now I, told, I used to tell my PA students, take your hands, stick them in your back pocket, and what happens is now your, your hands in the back pocket, the fingers are going the opposite way. They're going, hard to do, I can't do it. They're running downwards and out. So while my external obliques are running this way, the internal obliques underneath it are running this way. I should have done that with a different color, shouldn't I? They're running in this way. Now what I have is I have two muscles that are very thin, but the fibers are running in opposite directions. External intercostals, or actually, intercostals. Exter external oblique is running this way. Internal oblique is running this way. And as a result, it provides considerable strength. If I said intercostal, I'm, again, it's like three in the morning. So I, I get external intercostal versus internal. Inter Don't say intercostal. Wake up, wake up. Uh, external oblique, internal oblique. External oblique runs this direction, internal oblique runs this direction, and because they cross, it provides strength. Well, guess what? We still have a third layer. There's a third layer that's underneath it, okay? So if I look here and go and click, click my next little button, there's the external oblique and internal oblique, okay? We also have deep to that what's called the transversus abdominis. That would be this layer in here. So now I have my external oblique running in this direction. I have my internal ob oblique running in this direction. And I have my transversus abdominis running in 
this direction. Now I have three different muscle fiber, three different layers of muscles. They're very thin, but they run uh, angles to each other. And by doing that, it provides considerable strength. So my external oblique runs one way, and my internal oblique runs another way, and my transversus abdominis runs from side to side, and it works out well. Okay, and that's where. They, in fact, when they open up the abdomen, when they start to go through each layer, you can actually see the way the fibers run, and they sometimes will actually change the orientation to so that what they they cut instead of cutting across the myel muscle fiber, if they can, they try to cut in line with it and separate the muscle fibers because it heals better. Okay, so that's called that's the external uh, 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 oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. One other thing I want to mention, and let me get rid of these right here before we leave uh, this view, is this area right here that goes straight up the middle of the abdomen. Uh, remember, in the back of the femur, in the, down the back of the femur, we saw a thing called the linea aspera. Linea means line. Well, right up the middle of the abdomen, we have what's called the linea alba. Alba means white. There's a white line that runs straight up, and it's basically where all the muscles come together with a dense band of fascia. Right underneath that blue line right there, there's no muscle. It's all dense connective tissue. All these layers are actually blended together. All the the, uh, the, the, the the fascia that covers that, you know, the epimyceum that, that covers all the muscle comes together into one large, very strong band right down the middle. When they you do, you, when they used to do a lot of uh, open abdominal surgery, what they did was the best place to do was take an incision, go right down this. When they got to the umbilicus, they actually curved around the umbilicus and went down. And therefore, they didn't have to worry about damaging muscle. Basically, all they did was sew up the fascia and fascia healed with scar, you know, which was very op optimal. Well, what happens is, Inside this sheath that's right here, okay, you can see it, it's been open right here. This area right here has another muscle that runs in this direction, another muscle that runs in this direction, and that's called the rectus abdominis. So when you talk about someone says, oh, he has great washboard abs, that's what they're seeing. They're seeing these this muscle called the rectus abdominis. Rectus is a word that means straight means straight. So this rectus abdominis, we have straight fibers, but if I look at those straight fibers, what happens is on those fibers, they have little segments. It's divided off, this muscle is divided off into a segment. So there'd be a segment here, a segment here, a segment here. Sometimes there's another segment here, which creates a lump, 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 all the way down, and that's what gives that washboard abdomen because this muscle, which is a long strap muscle, is basically divided off in segments, and that's called the rectus abdominis. The rectus abdominis, and that line right down the middle, again, if they open up the skin, that line is sort of pale and white. Why? Because it's dense connective tissue called the linea alba. Linea, line, alba, white. Okay, so that's looking at the, at the front of the, of the torso. And this is, let's look at the back here. If we look at the back, a couple muscles that we see, we talked about the, let's let's go them one at a time and see where I go from here. Please don't fail on me now. My cursor's doing circles again. Okay, if I look here, this is the trapezius, okay? Let's see what we got. Here's the trapezius. It gets a, a large triangular shaped muscle, okay? If you look, it attaches superior to the, to the spine and the scapula, it goes all the way across the top. And if you look, you feel that sort of wing at the top of the, just above your shoulder right there, that's the trapezius. It's a very powerful muscle and it basically holds the arm in position like that. It goes all the way to the spine, okay? And up in the here, up in the back, up in the back right here, and up, you see how it's white? That's actually called the ligamentum nuce. Ligamentum, ligament, nuce, nuke, nucle means neck. So it's a ligamentum nuce, which actually is provide this dense connective tissue that holds the trapezius together up here in the back of the neck. Okay. So this large muscle right here is called the trapezius. Okay. That's the trapezius muscle. That one's an easy one. You can't miss that one. That one's a that one's a no brainer. That one's a hundred percenter. I could always see that. Uh, next muscle I look at is this little muscle right here. Okay. And this little muscle right here. It's called the levator scapulae. Levator scapulae. Well, guess what? <coughs> levator means what? Elevate. Levator scapulae takes this corner, this angle of the scapula. Okay. If I look at the angle of the scapula right here, it takes this angle of the scapula and elevates it, pulls it up. And that's what the levator scapulae does. It's this small muscle right here. Little comes this way in the back of the neck. Levator scapulae. Okay. And that's a that's a that's a that's a it's a pretty small muscle, but it does a lot of work. Okay, next muscle, a deltoid. We talked about that. I don't want to spend much more time with the deltoid, but just to show you how here it follows along. And before we saw it below the clavicle, now we're at this point following along the lower rim 
of the of the of the scapular spine coming here. You see how it's a triangular shaped muscle, that deltoid, all the way around. And that's basically my deltoid muscle. So that's one you shouldn't miss at all. That one's a that one's an easy one to, to, to pick out, you know. So that's the deltoid. What else do we have here? Oh, we got a couple more here. This muscle right here is called the rhomboideus major and rhomboideus minor. And they're called rhomboideus because they look like rhomboids. The larger one on the bottom is the major, the one on the top is called the minor. And what they do is the muscle actually takes a scapula and stabilizes it and pulls it towards the vertebrae, just to keep it nice and stable. The ability for me to move my arm depends upon not just the muscles in my arm, but how the scapula is stabilized against the thorax. If the scapula is unstable against the thorax and not held against the thorax, my arm movements become very poor. Okay, so, this, so these rhomboids are really, 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 really critical and important in helping to stabilize the scapula. So this would be the medial board of the scapula right there, and the rhomboids are attached there, and they pull the scapula this way, so as a result, they, they result in a lot of stabilization. I have a friend who is a, who is a trainer for, um, he was a, a trainer for the Gladiators and a bunch of other teams, and basically he's big into scapular stabilization. His whole series of procedures or uh, exercises to be able to stabilize the scapula, and I know that he, uh, with all his throwing sports, all the, those people were always in type of scapular stabilizing because it makes their arm work better. Next muscle I wanted to show right here is the supraspinatus. Okay. This right here is the supraspinatus. We talked about the scapula posteriorly has the spine that sits right here, and on top of it there is a fossa. That supraspinous fossa, what sits in there? The supraspinatus. What does the supraspinatus do? It abducts the arm. It pulls the arm out. What happens is the muscle belly sits up in this area. The muscle belly sits up in here, okay, and it gets as it comes to the shoulder right here. This area right here would be the chromion, and the, sub, the, the supraspinatus runs underneath the acromion and attaches the, uh, to the superior anterior portion of the of the humerus. It helps to elevate the arm up this way, okay, in those tubercle in that tubercle region. So that's the supraspinatus, okay. One thing you should remember about the supraspinatus is muscle number one of the rotator cuff, rotator cuff muscle. There are four muscles of the rotator cuff, and the supraspinatus is one of them. Okay, so that's a supraspinatus. Next muscle I want to show here is the infraspinatus. So here's the here's the, the scapular spine again. Here's the scapular spine. Let me draw the scapular spine. Here's the scapular spine sitting right here, and this muscle that sits right here is the infraspinatus. It fits in that infraspinous fossa. What it does is it goes and attaches from the scapula here. Fibers come across this way and attaches on the, the posterior lateral portion of the head of the humerus of the greater tubercle region and it helps to external rotate. It's an external rotation uh, muscle of the arm, okay? It externally rotates the arm. So, therefore, it also is the second muscle of my rotator cuff, the infraspinatus, okay? Now, right below the infraspinatus, okay, is another muscle called the teres minor. And the teres minor is this muscle right here. Oop, let me get it in there. Teres minor is this muscle right oops, right here. That's a teres minor. Sometimes you can't even tell much of the difference between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. There's sometimes a little small groove. And basically it attaches with the ter with the with the infraspinatus at that same area on the posterior lateral aspect by that greater tubercle of the humerus sitting right there. So that's the teres minor. That's the teres minor. Guess what? That's muscle number three of the rotator cuff. Muscle number three of the rotator cuff. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Three of the four. So we only have one more to go. Now we have another muscle that sits below that. That's called the teres major. The teres major, okay? This muscle attaches at the inferior angle of the scapula. Instead of going to the backside of the humerus like the teres minor and the, inf and the infraspinatus do, it actually runs around underneath the humerus and attaches the front side of the humerus. Okay? It turns out to be a little bit of an internal rotator, but it's more important in bringing the humerus down, bringing the humerus to the side, and that's called the teres minor. Well, guess what that is? If you said the fourth muscle of the rotator cuff, you're wrong. <coughs> lose. It's not. It's not the fourth muscle, but it's a, it's a, it's pretty big, big muscle. Helps to bring the arm down more than anything. It's a little bit of rotation, but helps to bring the arm down. Okay. And that's the teres, 
teres major. Now, you're going to say, well, what's that fourth muscle? You've got to tell me because I won't be able to sleep tonight. That fourth muscle is on the opposite side of the scapula. If you remember, on the posterior side, we have the supraspinous fossa, we have the infraspinous fossa. On the anterior side of the scapula, closer to the chest wall, we have the subscapular fossa. Inside that subscapular fossa sits a muscle called the subscapularis. Subscapularis. Subscapularis is an internal rotator, and that's the fourth muscle of the rotator cuff. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. And it's an internal rotator, attaches the humerus in the front at that lesser tubercle region. Okay? And that's the that's the subscapularis. Okay? Latissimus dorsi. Here's that latissimus dorsi down in here. We talked about. We saw before a little bit. And the latissimus dorsi is actually a very large muscle. Okay, and it comes around and swings around the whole back and comes around to the front of the arm. And actually helps to bring the arm in a little bit, rotate it in, and pulls the arm across this way and down. Uh, it's a very strong muscle. Uh, people who do a lot of workouts, they do what are called lat pull downs. They'll grab the bar, you know, suspended weights, and they pull it down. And by pulling it down, that's what the latissimus dorsi does. You see, it's coming from underneath the arm, coming from up underneath the arm here, and pulling the arm down. So they do what they call lat pull downs, and that's called a lat pull down. So that's the latissimus dorsi, quite a large, uh, large uh, uh, muscle. Uh, lat it's lateral, okay, and posterior. Dorsi means post dorsi, dorsal means posterior. So that makes sense. It's probably easy to figure that one out. So that's called the latissimus dorsi. I think I would know all those muscles we've talked about thus far today. Serratus anterior. Here's that serratus anterior we saw. We see a little bit of it here, and again in that serrated fashion. Sort of it's it's a muscle in a bunch of bands coming out here. And when it attaches, you'll actually see they attach in little like fingers or little digits that serrated edge anteriorly, and that's called the serratus anterior. Okay. And the external uh, uh, oblique, okay, external abdominal oblique and internal abdominal oblique. I don't want to go over that because I'll still get confused. And I won't get confused, but I'm still tired. We talked about how they run in different directions. External oblique running in this direction, internal oblique running the opposite direction, and transverse abdominus running across, okay? And that's the external uh, and internal um, ob ob obliques, okay? Uh, this is just looking at the cadaver, looking at the front, and you can see a couple things. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that because we're running really, 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 really long on this lab. If I look here, you can see where the pectoralis major is up in here, this area. Uh, you can see a little bit of the latissimus dorsi maybe there. You can see the rectus abdominis coming down in through here. You know, So I'll let you take your old time. You can actually compare on here with what you see on this view uh, on your own time, but you can see some of those things. Like I just thought it was nice to look and see what the cadaver really looks like. And this is better. You can actually see this a little bit better because here's the trapezius. You can see the trapezius right here. Here's that ligament of nuche. It sits up in there, okay? So you see the ligament of nuche down here uh, because nuchal means, means neck. Here's the latissimus dorsi sitting in here, latissimus dorsi. Uh, you see the teres minor, or teres, excuse me, teres major right there. Here is, right here is the infraspinatus, and here would be the teres minor. Here's the deltoid over here. You can see the rhomboids. Rhomboids are easy to see right here. You know, here's the levator scapulae sitting right there. So I got all these marks. You can't see anything now. So you can actually look at the numbers are on there and compare what you see on the cadaver with what you see over here on the slide. Okay. This is just a couple examples of a couple things. This right here we know is the levator scapulae. That's the way it goes in the purple there. Here are the rhomboids right here. You know, here's the uh, infras here's the uh, uh, infraspinatus. Here's the uh, teres minor. Here's the teres major over here. Here's the latissimus dorsi going in, going in this way. Okay. Here's the triceps right there. This is just another cadaver view of looking at the at the at the trapezius. The trapezius. Okay. And the rhomboids are deep to the trapezius, by the way. So the trape trapezius has been taken off here to be able to see the rhomboids. So here's the trapezius over here on this view. Uh, here again is the uh, uh, teres minor. Here's the infraspinatus right there. You see a little supraspinatus up in here. Here's the infraspinatus, teres minor. Here's the teres major, which you see is a lot bigger than teres minor. Latissimus dorsi. Again, the rhomboids. Here's the rhomboids again that we see right there at that point. 
that pretty much concludes what I want to talk about today. Next lab I'll be talking about, we'll be talking about um, the extremities, which has a lot of individual muscles that we'll talk about. And we'll, 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 we'll break it down into layers. So what you can see is, again, I, if I look at the head and the face, muscles of mastication versus facial muscles versus the, versus the levator, levator palpebrae superioris. We saw a number of anterior trunk muscles and posterior trunk muscles. I think I'd acquaint yourself with these really well, okay? And uh, hopefully you've learned something from the lab today. You've seen these things. Now twice. If you were if you if you were at the WebEx meeting, you saw them once. Now you see them again, and again, maybe a few more times, and you'll have this in like like it's second nature. You'll be wake up in the middle of the night, you know, yelling out muscles in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about in this particular lab. Hopefully, uh, you learned something. Uh, again, go over these as many times as you want to learn them, wherever you want, in bed, uh, in your car. Don't do it in your car. Because I don't want you getting in, in an accident. All of a sudden, the policeman says, "What were you doing?" Well, I was watching Dr. Lichnick do an anatomy uh, cadaver or a uh, 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 head, face, and trunk uh, uh, lecture. And don't do that. So, and it would be safe. Anyway, in the meantime, until I see you again, which will probably be real soon, um, be safe, be healthy, and um, you know, enjoy your life. Talk to you later.